This video is sponsored by Idle Heroes. Click the link in the description to download the game for free. Hey guys, JK Rowling here to make a little clarification on something that's of monumental importance to the world of Harry Potter. Yes, Quidditch players can get CTE. <laughs> In fact, there are a lot of squibs out there who weren't born non-magical, but lost their abilities after repeated blows to the head by bludgers. <laughs> and why hasn't Hermione raised the alarm about this along with House Elf Liberation? Well, she's getting kickbacks from the Quidditch Association who want to make sure those fat advertising checks from Birdie Bot's Every Flavor Beans keep on coming. But can't magic cure CTE, you might ask? After all, it fixed Harry's broken skull. Well, it could, but Madame Pomfrey is in bed with Big Potion, who wants you to be hooked on their Brain Be Good elixir. All right, you may have figured out by now that A, I'm not actually JK Rowling, and B, this video is in regards to her various tweaks to Harry Potter canon. What started as a clarification on Dumbledore's personal life mere months after the series concluded, slowly evolved into an avalanche of unnecessary canon additions to the Harry Potter universe. That avalanche recently gave us the qualification on the specific intensity of Dumbledore's romantic life, but nothing will ever top the revelation that wizards, historically speaking, used to poo themselves. So we had to ask, why? Why is this happening? For fans, craving more detail about fictional worlds we're invested in is simple and incredibly relatable. We love these worlds and we want to know more. We start with a question like, where did Snoke come from? Or was Cobb still dreaming? Then we move on to big questions like, is Toad's mushroom a hat or part of his head? Those questions beget more questions until we find ourselves asking the real questions like, if wizards rejected muggle technology, why are there toilets in Hogwarts? And that's why we're here today. Of course, JK Rowling isn't the only huckster of canon. As Mike Rugnetta notes in his incredible essay, Canon is an Abyss, these occurrences are everywhere. Nintendo has confirmed that Toad's head is not a hat, and a designer from Dungeons and Dragons has canonically declared that gnome butts smell like honeysuckle and bromine. More recently, Kevin Feige has canonically clarified why Nick Fury didn't call Captain Marvel during several near extinction scenarios. While Rugnetta has argued that canon is a bottomless abyss of which there is no end, and he's not wrong, I think there's another way to understand our canonical obsession. And it's not just about how we interact with the fictional worlds we love, but how we interact with our own world. Welcome to this Wisecrack edition on canon, and spoilers ahead for Harry Potter. But before we jump into that, I want to give a shout out to our sponsors over at Idle Heroes. I spend most of my days thinking critically about books, movies, TV shows, and general culture stuff, so the thing that really allows me to unwind is video games. Idle Heroes reached out to see if we dig their game, so I downloaded it, and it's an awesome hero collector game. Best part is the game has a really great sense of humor. The hero designs are colorful, hilarious, and the animations are really dynamic. You can play anytime, anywhere. There are six factions in the game, more than 300 unique heroes, daily tasks you can complete in just five minutes, and longer quests too. All you need to bring to the battle is strategy. So if you want to give it a try for yourself, check it out now by clicking the link in the description to download Idle Heroes for free. And now, back to the show. In terms of canon, we are living in a very specific historical moment. Now, first of all, Shakespeare didn't have Twitter, but more importantly, he wasn't living in an era of engagement. Brands don't just make extra canonical content due to our voracious demand, they do it in the name of one of the most important marketing metrics, engagement. Engagement is, in the world of brand building, simply any level of interactivity with a brand beyond spectatorship. That means likes, shares, forum posts, fan theories, it's all engagement. Today, the number of eyeballs on your brand isn't enough. Social media marketers and YouTubers know the real way to spread brand recall is to have consumers interact with your brand. Hence the birth of alternate reality games to promote shows, clever subway ads that make you do puzzles, or the rise of comments and view time as meaningful measurements of success. In the world of content production, canon is engagement and engagement is money. JK Rowling may not be explicitly out to make a buck by manufacturing more and more canon, but the study of canon, the discussion of canon, and the consuming of canon all create meaningful engagement for the Harry Potter brand. Whether it's a Gryffindor scarf, a custom lightsaber, or a collectible Pickle Rick, engagement moves inventory. 
And this logic has taken over everything. This kind of canon production may have existed in games like Warhammer or Dungeons and Dragons back in the day, but it's slowly overtaking the mainstream. Today's games like Overwatch or Apex Legends have whole character biographies and additional canon to consume along with them. These games are, by their very format, plotless, but plotless games don't make for good, meaningful emotional engagement. And meaningful emotional engagement means buku bucks. But I don't want to pin this on mean companies emotionally exploiting our need to be absorbed in a highly monetized fantasy world. After all, JK Rowling has more than enough money. But if we go back to even before stock markets, we can see how canonical meddling was less about making money and more about anxiety over one's place in the world. Like Rowling, authors have long been clarifying their works. Even Cicero, as classics professor Caroline Bishop notes, meticulously commented on his old texts and speeches, clarifying how his original works should really be read. This meddling inspired others, Virgil, Horace, and Propecius, to give the reader a helping hand in interpreting their own words. Bishop notes that J.K. Rowling finds herself in the company of Nabokov, who wrote his own Ed Notes for Ada under a pseudonym, and T.S. Eliot, who provided his own notes to his famous work, The Wasteland. In many cases, clarifying canon spoke to an authorial anxiety. Cicero, Bishop writes, wanted to cement his legacy and, because he was a politician, win more votes. There were few things more important than legacy to these giants of intellect, and continually revising their work was their way of trying to ensure their image lived on. Unlike Rowling, T.S. Eliot, Nabokov, Cicero, or Virgil didn't have Twitter, and thus didn't have hordes of fans asking just how intense was Humbert Humbert's romantic life. Thank God. Now on the one hand, I really don't want to know. But on the other, the ease of which canon can be tweaked now with a tweet or a television appearance means authors are even more prone to impulsivity. And as we'll argue, the resulting abyss of canon isn't just annoying, it can make our lives deeply nihilistic. Now to find out just what the hell we're talking about, we're gonna get real metaphysical with 20th century philosopher Martin Heidegger. Heidegger's primary focus was our existence in the world. He argued that since the ancient Greeks, philosophers, and literally everyone else deeply misunderstood the question of being, so much so that he had to invent a bunch of words just to explain it. Now this all gets really jargony and hard to follow, but most simply, he is less interested in being than what he calls Dasein, which translates to being there. In other words, humans don't exist as some isolated entity apart from everything else. We exist in a world. So to understand our existence, we have to understand our relationship to the environment around us. As such, instead of simply being, his writing is full of being with, being in, and being towards. Which brings us to being in the world, the idea that our existence is fully immersed in the reality around us. For Heidegger, we are thrown into the world, and this thrownness, which is his term, is a key component of our being. As philosopher Simon Critchley summarizes, thrownness is the simple awareness that we always find ourselves somewhere, namely delivered over to a world with which we are fascinated, a world we share with others. There's something about the fictional worlds we get lost in that speaks to this basic question of being. When we read Harry Potter, we lose ourselves in the narrative of a boy destined to be a great wizard, and we are, metaphorically speaking, thrown into this fictional universe, and along with other fans, are enthralled and curious about the laws of magic, the history of Hogwarts, and so on. For Heidegger, being in the world is about the world disclosing itself to us. In a book like Harry Potter, the author discloses, much more literally, a world and its logic, rules, mysteries, emotions, and so on. This disclosure happens in dialogue, say when Hagrid explains to Harry that he's a wizard. You're a wizard, Harry. When we flash back to the truth about Snape, or just the simple descriptions of sentient paintings and nearly headless ghosts. We can say the same of Star Wars, or John Wick, or any imaginary world. I am your father, as uttered by Darth Vader, discloses a whole new side to the fictional universe of Star Wars. So narratives disclose their worlds to us, not unlike how the world discloses itself to us. Cool. But does that mean there's no difference between learning that Snape was always on Team Harry and the notion that wizards used to poo themselves? Are they both just satiating a curiosity that is fundamental to our existence? Well, again, I'm going to argue no. In fact, the canon updating via tweets might even make us all nihilists. 
The problem for Heidegger is when our understanding of things becomes instrumental. For instance, if I'm looking to make a table, a tree starts looking like nothing but a nice future two by four. That understanding can conceal the other facets of its existence, like its importance in the ecosystem of a forest, its history starting from a seed, or even just appreciating it for its beauty. Heidegger labels this kind of thinking technological, that the vast array of ways we relate to the world is reduced to the practical, that a tree exists solely to make wood, a horse exists solely to ride, or that fellow humans exist solely as networking opportunities. In the Potterverse, the problem isn't necessarily that we're intrigued by taxonomies of magical creatures, but that we want to reduce a mesmerizing fantasy into a rational, clearly ordered world. What we gain in knowing the history of plumbing in Hogwarts, we lose in our original relationship to the text, our sense of wonderment, inspiration, etc. For Heidegger, this technological rationality always conceals as it reveals. In the real world, this leaves us homeless, as Heidegger says. But what does he mean by this? Well, that this narrative we've spun of us looking down upon our ordered world has made us forget our original relationship of being immersed into that world. And it starts to feel alien to us. And that's the kind of nihilism Heidegger is talking about. The world loses meaning. As Critchley writes, Heidegger insists that we have to thrust aside our interpretive tendencies which cover over our everyday experience of the world and attend much more closely to that which shows itself. So while we're busy reading JK's updates about the history of Hogwarts plumbing, we can seal other aspects of the book, like all the feels of Dobby dying a free elf. That and every revelation usually just begets more questions, and as a result, there's no end to what Rowling or others must reveal. The revelation that wizards pooped themselves until somewhat recently was begat by a screed in which JK Rowling felt compelled to explain why there were bathrooms in Hogwarts. Wizards we've been told don't use muggle technology, so why do they have plumbing? And at this point, instead of letting this fictional world be, she decided to answer that plumbing was introduced in the 18th century. So did wizards relieve themselves in magical bowls or bedpans before then? Nope, they just let it out wherever they were before magically disposing of it. From here, as I'm sure Heidegger would have warned if he was caught up on Harry Potter lore, we might ask, well then who installed the plumbing? Why is there mention of bedpans in Prisoner of Azkaban? Does this imply that wizards can be too ill to magically unsoil themselves? Has Madame Pomfrey forgotten the lost art of depoument? Is this the kind of magic that lies hidden in the restricted section of the library? Did muggle-born wizards back in the day who were acquainted with an outhouse ever become homesick for their ancestral way of doing their business? The point is, in our obsession with canon, we can often lose sight of what makes a piece of fiction amazing in the first place. Mark Twain recounted in a very coincidental Heideggerian way about a similar experience with his childhood love of the Mississippi River. As he became an experienced riverboat pilot, the river lost its mystery and magnificence. He wrote in Life on the Mississippi, Now when I had mastered the language of this water and had come to know every trifling feature that bordered the great river as familiarly as I knew the letters of the alphabet, I had made a valuable acquisition. But I had lost something too. I had lost something which could never be restored to me while I lived. All the grace, the beauty, the poetry had gone out of the majestic river. For Heidegger, there lies a solution to this called releasement. That is, allowing the world to disclose itself in all of its facets to us. For Mark Twain, that is the poetry and grace of the Mississippi before he learned to masterfully navigate its treacherous waters. And maybe that's what letting Harry Potter be means. Not learning to navigate the nooks and crannies of canon to figure out how Draco eats his steak, but just to appreciate it. Now importantly, that's not to say you can't engage deeper. You can read, reread, and constantly discover new facets and meanings that the text discloses. But that doesn't mean you should necessarily reread all seven books to simply build evidence for your theory that Harry owes back taxes for his inheritance. And that's why, for example, my favorite show of all time is Twin Peaks, but I refuse to make a wisecrack video about it. Trying to make logical sense about a show that is so largely about tone, atmosphere, and visual artistry will only ruin those elements that have captivated me like no other show. So what do you guys think? Should we embrace the scatology of Hogwarts in all its glory or just let pooping wizards lie? Let us know what you think in the comments. And as always, thanks for watching guys. Peace.